Hi everyone and welcome back to lecture. Today we're going to be focusing on chapter 3 of the textbook which examines the governmental regulation of drug use and the criminalization of certain drugs over time. Let's go ahead and get started. Today all drugs are regulated and the government has a say in which drugs we can have access to. Some need a prescription, some can be purchased over the counter, and others are completely outlawed altogether. But for a while, there was no marketing or regulation whatsoever. People and companies made what they wanted to make and sold what they wanted to sell. They weren't required to list ingredients on the bottles. They weren't required to inform the government of what they were selling. It was basically a free-for-all. And you can imagine with no governmental oversight what kinds of ingredients were going into the medicines that people were making in their kitchens or their bathtubs. The medicines that I'm referring to here are called patent medicines. So not necessarily medicines that have been patented by pharmaceutical companies, but medicines that have secret ingredients. These medications were promoted as magical life-saving elixirs, meant to solve a variety of problems. However, they didn't actually do anything to solve your medical problems other than getting you drunk or doping you up. The main ingredient for many of these medications was alcohol. But you have to remember that medicine was not very advanced at this time. I mean, we didn't even know what germs were until 1861 when Louis Pasteur passed, uh, published rather, his theories on these issues. So what kind of things are being sold? This picture right here shows an advertisement for Dr. Chilton's permanent fever, fever and ague cure. It was only one dollar a box. They contain no arsenic, mercury, or mineral poisons. Well, that's probably a good thing, but what did they actually do? Taking according to the directions, Dr. Chilton's permanent, ague, or permanent fever and ague cure um, claims to be never failing. They'll cure you of incipient stages of bilious fever. Bilious fever, what is that, Might you might ask? Basically, it's any fever that is, exhibits a symptom of nausea or vomiting in addition to the fever and strong cases of diarrhea. They're all perfectly portable and they may be sent by mail to any place. They will cure when all other remedies fail. They only need to be tried once to be appreciated. I know that this picture might be a little bit difficult for you to read, but the makers of this medicine are promoting it as a cure-all in any way. The medicine will never fail you and will solve all your problems for just a dollar. A dollar is a lot of money at the time, so if people are going to pay that much for something, then you know that they were hoping it would really work. So we're talking about a drug that is supposed to cure bilious fever, which bilious fever we just said had strong cases of diarrhea with it. So what might be in this medicine that would help cure diarrhea? Well, the main ingredient was opium. Opium and most opioid drugs that um, are derived from opium will give you constipation. So if you are trying to get rid of your diarrhea, then a strong uh, dose of opium will cure that up for you real quick. The next slide here shows snake oil. Snake oil was a pretty popular patent medicine and was found to contain mineral oil, fatty oils, red pepper, turpentine, camphor, camphor is basically a waxy white flammable solid and it was used primarily at the time as an embalming fluid. You can think of snake oil as being very similar to a capsaicin-based liniment or a chest rub. Sadly, there's nothing in this bottle that comes from actual snakes and not from rattlesnakes either, even though they claim to on the label. Here is a closer look at the bottle label. As you can see, it is recommended to be an external rub. And the idea is that if you rub, rub the snake oil on whatever was afflicting you, this miracle cure would take care of it all for you. And you probably actually did feel something and thought it was working due to the capsaicin that was found in the red peppers. Capsaicin, if you rub it on something, it sometimes will make your skin feel a little tingly. So if that's what you're feeling, you probably believed it to be working. Here's another advertisement for a tonic. This ad reads, quote, Parker's Tonic, the great health and strength restorer. C cures coughs, consumption, asthma by rejuvenating the blood. Wonderful cures for rheumatism, nervousness, and kidney complaint have all made Parker's Tonic popular. 
Um, you can see in the ad here, there's this sort of sickly invalid man on the left, and he says, oh, that I had your health and appetite. And the man on the right, um, who looks pretty healthy and is eating his dinner here, is pouring him a small glass, pouring himself rather, a small glass of Parker's tonic, and he replies to the older individual, um, quote, I was miserable as you until Parker's tonic cured me. An occasional dose before eating keeps me well. So here's what's helping the man on the right. Parker's tonic is actually an alcoholic sarsaparilla-based tonic, and this means that it was 41.6% alcohol or 83 proof. Drinking a glass of that every day would make anyone feel pretty great. This medication on your screen claims to be able to cure venereal diseases. Venereal diseases are actually sexually transmitted diseases, um, but once again, this is mostly alcohol and doesn't really do anything to cure a venereal disease. But maybe if you drink enough of it, you'll be a little less sad about catching the clap. This si slide shows an advertisement for soothing syrup. Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, and this was a pretty popular medication at the time. Um, Samuel Clemens actually wrote about it. Samuel Clemens, you might know more um, popularly, I guess, as Mark Twain, and he writes in 1876 that um, a man he knew got terrifically drunk on the 4th of July on a barrel of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. What was not known at the time for people who used it um, was that Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup actually contained opiates. So you, by drinking this, you would get um, in a bottle, it contained half a gram of morphine, one and a half ounces of syrup, and a half an ounce of water. So if you took a dose, that's basically what you would be getting. So this medication contains opium, morphine, and cocaine, and it would it actually ended up killing some of the children that would take it um, because they would not be prepared enough. Their little systems were not prepared enough to take on this type of medication. So pretty dangerous, dangerous at the time, but it is advertised as being this cure-all. Here we have an advertisement for Espix cigarettes, which are meant to cure asthma, something that you might think would be counterintuitive. Normally, smoking makes asthma worse. But really, when you smoke something, what it's doing is helping to sort of clear or open up those bronchial dieways, airways rather that we all have, and it can temporarily help you breathe better. So not by any means a long-term solution, but it will help temporarily. So what else are these cigarettes doing? They are helping with catar, cat, tara, sorry for that uh, pronunciation there. Um, Obviously, these are not things that we talk about much anymore, but basically this is an excessive discharge or buildup of mucus in the nose and throat, and it is often in, uh, associated with inflammation of your mucous membrane. This is also going to help you with oppression and suffocation, which is basically another word for an asthma attack given the time period. And finally, neural neurologia. Um, which is an intense, typically intermittent pain along the course of a nerve, especially in your head or your face. So, sorry, I am not the medical doctor um, that you, maybe you were expecting, but um, I'm doing my best to pronounce some of these terms for you guys. Okay, so here's our last advertisement, and of course, when you have all these different companies promoting these patent medicines, which are starting to earn a bad reputation, then legitimate alcohol companies are stepping in to compete with these patent medicines. And basically what their, their argument is, is that when you drink a, a beer, you know what's in the bottle. You're taking a chance with other types of medications in which they are promoting themselves as these miracle cure-alls, but when you drink a bud, you know what's going to be in the bottle. Um, and basically what they're saying here is a bud is a bud, and um, you know what you're going to get from us. So we don't know what's in many of the medications that we're taking, and no one is writing anything on the labels because no one is requiring them to. So the government steps in and says, you know, this is not going so well. We have people that are dying, people that are becoming addictive to these different types of medications, and we just can't have this happening. So the government passes the Food and Drug Act in 1906, and basically what this 
Act says is that everything that is produced in the United States has to have a label of ingredients now. But this isn't necessarily just about the patent medicines. This was about the entire food and drug industry and how there were a lot of shortcuts being taken and people were not doing their jobs. So in 1906, um, a newspaper reporter named Up Upton Sinclair actually writes a book called The Jungle in which he portrays the very harsh conditions and exploited lives of many of the immigrants um, living in Chicago in particular and how similar industrialized cities have some of the same problems that Chicago is having. If you've ever read The Jungle, it might be a book that puts you off of meat for a little while because it talks specifically about the meat packing industries in Chicago. Um, and it was sort of the shocking expose at the time. And many of the readers were very concerned about the exposure of health violations and some of the unsanitary practices that were taking place in the American meatpacking industry at the time. And based on this um, book that he wrote, the person that really got the ball rolling was President Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt gets this book and he's reading about how about these very graphic depictions of working class poverty, the lack of social support that many in the, many of these individuals have, the harsh and unpleasant living conditions that they are exposed to, and basically says something needs to be done here. So Teddy Roosevelt reads it, he's absolutely horrified and basically commissions a committee to review not only the meatpacking industry throughout the country, but all food and drug industries everywhere. So now we're starting to get inspections in our co in our factories and in these companies. There's regulations on what can be sold and labels have to go on absolutely everything. So now the labels that we're seeing are a little bit, they're, they're not... Um, outlawing the, pro the ingredients, but they are making the companies describe what's in there. So the first ad you see now, instead of those patent medicine advertisements we saw before, now you see the actual ingredients. So right away you see cocaine tooth drops. And cocaine actually would be a really good fit for a toothache because cocaine has a numbing agent. So at the time, not knowing the dangers of cocaine, um, people would suck on a toothache drop and their toothache would actually go away. Here we have a um, drug that is supposed to get you off of all other drugs. And this drug, Morphina Cura, um, its main ingredient is morphine. So yeah, that'll get you off something else, um, but now you're hooked on morphine. So not the best idea. This one here is probably the most well known. Um, there was always this sort of urban legend that Coke products actually contained cocaine, and that is true. So not much of an urban legend these days. Each uh, glass of Coca-Cola contained nine milligrams of cocaine. It was officially removed from the recipe in 1903, but the recipe does still contain a cocaine-free version of the coca leaf, which um, Coca-Cola uses as a flavor additive. So the same plant, but actually no active ingredient in the Coca-Cola we drink today. Here's a cough medicine that it was produced by Bayer. Bayer is a German pharmaceutical company that is still in existence today. In 1901, they're advertising a cough medicine that contains heroin. This was not new for the time, but at least now we're telling you about it. Um, the hydrochloride will help you be able to digest the heroin better um, since you're essentially swallowing it rather than administering it intravenously. So the hydrochloride will help um, your the stomach absorb the heroin a little easier and disseminate it into your bloodstream more easily. The passage of the Food and Drug Act did not require a prescription for a lot of the medications I just talked about. Um, simply, re It simply required that you have to tell people what was in the medicines that they're taking or in the food and products that they're consuming. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act started to make the um, distinction between what needed a prescription and what did not need a prescription, but it was not concrete and did not and was not consistently administered by druggists. 
The Durham-Humphrey Amendment to the Food and Drug Act required that certain drugs needed prescriptions and that others did not. So now we have the first formalized mention of an over-the-counter drug, even though people had been really buying over-the-counter drugs for years. So this law categorized drugs based on dependency issues. If it was habit-forming, it should be supervised by a doctor, meaning it was not safe for self-medication. Or if the drug was brand new, then it would need to be a prescription drug first. This law also allowed for the refill of prescription medication for the first time ever. Many new drugs still fall into this class uh, categorization. Rather, If it is brand new, then they're going to require a prescription and unless it is um, formally designated specifically as an over-the-counter drug. For example, take the drug Nexium. This is a heartburn and acid reflux medication more commonly known as the purple pill. It was originally available only as a prescription and then after so many years it can be sold as an over-the-counter if you switch the formula enough um, that it doesn't require it to remain prescription strength. But the FDA must approve the switch from prescription to over-the-counter. We call this a prescription to over-the-counter switch. Um, it, in addition, it cannot approve the effectiveness of the drug. Um, it, this really is relying on individual doctors at the time to make the determine as to whether or not the drug worked for the individual patient. Every cha everything changed in the 1950s and 1960s with the, with the use of thalidomide. Thalidomide was only briefly used in the United States but was widely used um, in Europe, Canada, and Africa as a way to treat morning sickness in pregnant women. But this was a drug that was never evaluated before it was dispensed. And yes, it did indeed help lower, help lower the symptoms associated with morning sickness in pregnant women. But then we started having a bunch of babies that were born and they started being born with a bunch of genetic def uh, deformities. For thalidomide babies, basically it f um, these deformities focused on the limbs. The limbs were not growing the way all the way out um, the way they were supposed to in utero, utero and babies were coming out with appendages that sort of looked like flippers. The drug was altering the development of the fetus and other countries started experiencing these issues as well and now um, before really the evaluation continued to occur drug companies wanted to bring the drug to the United States on a large scale. They began distributing, after, distributing it after Richardson Merrill received testing approval for it in the 1960s. This was an old testing method. Basically, we get the drug, we distribute it, and we see what the effects are. Frances Kelsey knew what was going on in these other countries, and she demanded that Richardson Merrill provide testing results from the women who received the drug. They refused six times to provide the results. Kelsey shuts down the use of thalidomide in the United States, but 17 children are born with these deformities before thalidomide can be canceled out. So now people are calling on the FDA to be in charge of the testing. Do not let drug companies distribute the drugs without some sort of evaluation first. This is why we have different levels of drug testing and it takes so long to receive FDA approval for new drugs in this country. In the next couple of slides, I've, taken a, I, I've provided to you a few pictures of children who were born with the thalidomide deformities. You can see here in this first picture, this little boy has um, a brace of some kind on his arm to help him hold his pencil steady because it looks like he doesn't have all five fingers on this hand and his arm is rather short and underdeveloped. In this slide, you can see a couple little boys all together, and they all have these shorter, underdeveloped arms. Their fingers don't look like real long fingers, I guess if you would, um, but rather are sort of short and squat and kind of curl in a little bit um, and might not even be fully detached from one another. So again, taking on more of this flipper appearance. And then finally, you have this little baby here. This little boy um, was born with more of the flipper-like appearance, um, hands and legs, as you can tell. His feet kind of curl out a bit. His arms um, are not fully developed past the elbow and is a perfect example of what happened when the little mide um, would sort of alter the appearance of the child in utero. 
After this tragedy, the government said no more. You cannot just give people drugs and hope for the best. If you want to sell a drug, you have to prove that it does what you actually claim it to do. You have to clinically test it extensively, provide those results to the FDA. Then the FDA has to confirm the results through their own brand of testing. If we don't get the same results that you do, we're not going to let you sell the drug. The FDA also now has the right to take a drug off the market if it's causing more harm or if it's not doing what it was approved to do. Fenfen is a perfect example of a drug that was taken off market. Um, in the 1970s and the 1980s, it grew in mass popularity and became the most popular weight loss supplement in the world for a while. Clinical testing showed that the experimental group lost about twice as much weight as the control group. It was taken off the market, or it took off rather, um, and became massively popular. But then, FenFen users started having heart attacks and their heart valves were enlarging, resulting in um, higher frequencies of vascular heart disease. And those individuals who were drinking while they were using FenFen were experiencing even higher increased amounts of alcohol dependence. So it was taken off of the market. Viagra testing is another great example of something that was meant to do one thing and then turned out to be something else. So Viagra was actually um, created by Pfizer to be a heart pill. Um, but can you imagine what would happen if the FDA never tested Viagra before they sent it out to the world? Here you are with a heart condition and instead something else is happening very quickly. So the FDA is over here looking at prescription drugs, but sometimes over-the-counter drugs are strong enough to have some concerning properties as well. So it's time to look at basically everything. Now the FDA is going to evaluate everything um, that were designed as either prescription or over-the-counter drugs. By looking at them, the FDA will determine a few different things. One, are they gener generally recognized as being safe and effective? Um, if that's the case, then they can be allowed, allow the drug companies to market it and use them. So a Tylenol is generally safe and effective. If you take two Tylenol because you have a headache, then the consequences of taking that Tylenol are probably not um, very high risk. Is the drug unsafe and effective um, or are there some sort of unacceptable indications happening? So if that's the case, then they're not going to allow it to be marketed or used. Dependence on the drug, um, then there are going to be instances in which drug companies have restructured the formula or changed the dosage or whatever they have to do to produce a better over-the-counter product. Finally, what about the data? If there's insufficient data to permit classification, then the FDA, again, will not allow this drug to be marketed or used. So um, the drug companies have to test it sufficiently, and the FDA also has to have their results match those of the drug company, as I sort of indicated earlier. The FDA has a prescription to over-the-counter switch policy that allows for drug companies to distribute drugs as an over-the-counter version of the original prescription medication developed by the drug company. After three years of prescription status, the company can then apply for over-the-counter status. Many drug companies choose to change the strength of the drug and have a prescription version and a subsequent over-the-counter version. They can then make twice as many profits, um, and that's a good thing for the drug companies. It also has to be a very popular drug in order for it to qualify for this switching policy. If they choose to alter the product's formula or strength, the FDA has to approve the switch. Um, in this case, it may require additional testing depending on what the switch or change is to the formula or strength. There also can't be a large chance for drug interactions to occur. The, dosage, the dosages on a lot of these different over-the-counter drugs aren't so high that they could cause severe drug interactions, but still there is the concern. Again, Viagra, if we take this as our, our example, is not necessarily safe for self-medication, and it's often used by those who are a little bit older in age. When you're older, you normally are on more medications than younger people. You're on maybe a blood pressure excuse me, blood pressure medication, high cholesterol, a bunch of different things. So if you're taking 
Viagra and it inter interacts negatively with one of the prescription medications you're already on, then that could lead to um, adverse sort of drug reactions and that's something that we don't really want to do. So if you do have a heart condition um, and you are on heart medications, then Viagra might not necessarily be the right drug for you. If there was a lot, if this became an over-the-counter medication with no prescription and no oversight by a doctor, then you have the potential for a lot of heart patients to be having a really good time while they take Viagra, but they're ready to blow their hearts out. Drug advertising is something that is very pervasive in our culture and our society. Everywhere we look, we see a commercial for this and that, um, and a company that is trying to promote the newest drug of their choice. Basically, buy my pill and it will do this for you. Um, small bladder, there's a pill for that. You want to have sex anytime you want, there's a pill for that. Want to lower your cholesterol, you don't want heartburn, whatever you want, we have a pill for it. Um, whatever it is that you need, we can fill that need. And we have an advertisement to try and push it in your face, if you will. However, the advertising campaigns for these drugs um, have to follow certain regulations from the government in order to make sure that they're not promoting it as something other than what it really is intended for. So there are three elements to any advertisement that are required by the FDA in order for that as advertisement to be honest and truthful. So what are the three elements necessary in any pharmaceutical ad? First, you have to have the generic name of the drug. So not necessarily the brand name, which it can be there, but the generic name of the drug is mandatory. So for example, if you have a Tylenol commercial, you can advertise it as Tylenol, but somewhere in that advertisement, you need to see the, the term acetaminophen, which is the generic name for Tylenol. The ad also must include at least one approved use for the drug. So if you have a cholesterol medicine, you better tell me at some point that it lowers cholesterol. It lowers the chance of a heart attack and stroke, for example. Whatever your drug does, you have to tell me the benefits and the approved uses of that drug. But the most important thing is that you have to tell me about all of the risk factors associated with that drug. Right? So we all know about these commercials that talk about the risk factors. This drug may cause dizziness, chest pain, diarrhea, loss of memory, blood clots, joint pain, anal leakage. Those are the side effects? No, those are the main effects. The side effect is that it might lower your cholesterol. The Harrison Act of 1914, getting back into our legislation. This one um, regulated and taxed the production, importation, and distribution of opiate and coca products. Post-Civil War, there were so many people using opiate products, largely as a result of wartime injuries and stress. We peaked in 1896 where um, Americans were using more than half a million pounds of opium a year. And roughly two thirds of all opium addicts were actually women and they were being prescribed opium products to treat their female problems. Then manufacturers realized that opiates could be used for other things like the patent medicines that we discussed before. But this act was not in response to the patent medicines. This law was actually put into place for two specific reasons. One, there was an increased use of cocaine by recently freed slaves living in the South. This was a huge con concern for Southern citizens in um, particular because there was this very erroneous but very pervasive belief that these newly freed men, and when I say newly freed men, I'm talking about black men, um, who would go around and we were concerned that they would be raping our white women and with this stimulant going through them, they would be nearly indestructible. The second um, cause for concern was the increased use of opiate products, specifically the use of nearly pure opium that was being smoked on the West Coast. And on the West Coast, what you had were opium dens that were being brought over to the U.S. by Chinese immigrants 
who came over to build the railroads. So as you can see from these perceived threats, it wasn't so much necessarily about the drugs themselves, but more about the individuals who were using these drugs. We don't have a problem with recovering soldiers or their wives using opium, but we have a huge problem when it becomes the drug of choice for certain ethnic minorities. We'll see this racial threat idea pop up again and again as we discuss drug laws in this country throughout the semester. By 1914, 46 states had regulations on cocaine, and 29 of them had laws against opium-based products. But that's at the state level. So when the feds come in and they decide that they're going to get involved in it, we now have federal legislation um, talking about the same issue. So even though the government was trying um, to limit the availability of things like cocaine and opioids, are they correct in their reasoning? A large amount of their argument focused on the regulation of commerce, but this is really the first governmental law that is going to work to restrict and outlaw recreational use of certain narcotics. Um, but even still, it's not difficult to get um, all these different types of drugs, even though they are restricted in the way that they won't be later. This here is a picture of the Sears and Robot. Sears and Robux catalog, you can see here that there's cocaine available and also opium, um, particular opium powder and opium gum. So we have um, opium gum, and I'm just going to talk briefly about this because um, we're going to talk about it later on when we focus on opioids. But opium gum is basically the pure substance that when you crack open an opium or a po opium poppy seed, you're going to get this milky fluid that comes out. That's opium in its purest form. Once you let that that fluid sort of um, get exposed to the air and dry out more, it turns into a more gum-like substance that you can then turn into heroin and things like that. All right, so you have a country full of people who are using patent medicine, smoking opium, drinking Coca-Cola, and a variety of other things. Now the government wants to step in and they want to regulate everything, And how? but how do they actually do that? They're going to tax it, just like they do everything else. The biggest piece of legislation regarding drug regulation comes in 1970 in which drugs are divided into different categories based on their potential for abuse and their medical purposes. The Controlled Substances Act is actually one, um, the biggest piece that helps create the drug schedules we know today. The Nixon administration put together this piece of legislation that required the FDA and the DEA to put drugs into different schedules, moving things around and restructuring as need be. This was put into effect after years of studying the rate of drug use in this country. We're still involved at this time in a large-scale counterculture climate, meaning hippies, free love, all that stuff. People are smoking and using everything everywhere and are receiving very few penalties at this point for drug use. Marijuana is the biggest drug that they will study. Nixon appoints a commission who comes back and basically says that the penalties associated with drug use as Nixon require or wants them to be are basically too harsh and not effective. Nixon's commission basically advocates for decriminalization of marijuana, but Nixon was not on board with that um, and wanted marijuana criminalized most harshly because many of his opponents were um, more liberal in nature and were wanting um, decriminalization to occur. So at this point, it's basically marking the beginning of war on drugs, but is not actually termed that until next year when Nixon uses that formal language. So drug scheduling, we have five different classification structures within this. Schedule one drugs are the most restrictive. Um, they are considered to be the most harsh and habit forming. There's no medically approved use for scheduled one drugs in the United States. And at the time of this recording, marijuana has not gone fully legalized yet um, at the across the entire country or at the federal level. So one of the, the biggest arguments against the scheduling of, of marijuana as a Schedule One drug is the idea of um, medically accepted value. So in Schedule One, you have things like heroin, which is an opium derivative, LSD, which is a hallucinogen, ecstasy, which basically includes MDMA or molly, um, peyote is a hallucinogen that is used for Native American ceremonies, marijuana, we'll get into marijuana a lot this semester, um, and hashish or hash is basically a cannabis product um, that 
contains THC, but not as much THC as marijuana itself. Schedule 2 um, drugs do have a high potential for abuse, but there is a medically accepted value to them. So things like opium or morphine, these can be used as painkillers, um, but need to be highly regulated within a hospital setting. Cocaine, um, like I said to you earlier, is a numbing agent, so in a worst case scenario, can be used as um, an anesthetic in hospitals. Methamphetamine um, is a stimulant-based drug, and it can be used to treat um, hyperactivity disorders. It's not recommended, but it, it is possible to, to do it. Um, one of the best well-known meth users was Adolf Hitler, who was continuously prescribed meth towards the, towards the end of the war because his energy levels kept dragging. Um, you have PCP, which is better known as angel dust. Um, this was originally created as an anesthetic drug, but now it is more commonly used as a hallucinogen. And then barbiturates, which are depressant type drugs, um, which were used to treat depression. And then later on, we have other variations that stem from that drug line family. Schedule three, we have things like um, Hydro, uh, hydrocodone, Tylenol, codeine, normally things that are cut with different medications. Um, however, the, all hydrocodone products have been moved up to Schedule 2 as of August 2017. Um, your Schedule 4 drugs are those that need a prescription but are not necessarily over the counter. So things like Valium, Valium are in this category, main um, antidepressant type drugs. Schedule 5, these are all the things that do not need a prescription, but may need some sort of um, oversight, I guess, if you will, at specific pharmacies. So if you're buying Sudafed at the um, drugstore, they may need to run your license if it's the extra strength one out of concern that you're making meth, but you don't need a prescription for it. Okay, so how do you actually determine how drugs are scheduled? So first you have to look at whether or not these are creating a abuse or dependence in the person who is using them. So the higher the potential for abuse, the more it will move up the schedule. How often has this been studied in terms of the pharmacological effects and what do we know about the scientific knowledge regarding the, sub, the um, substance of, in question? This is in particular a big issue when it comes to marijuana because as marijuana is currently scheduled or classified as a Schedule One drug, um, those drugs are very rarely researched by the government. So it might have very little scientific support, formal scientific support for these studies. If you're a researcher who's trying to determine the effects of a drug, then you need government approval to study it. Or in this case, you would be breaking the law if you found some marijuana to study. Um, there are actual pot farms in the United States that are approved for use by the government um, for these different studies, but it is very difficult to get access to them and there aren't too many of them around. We're also going to look at the history and the current patterns of abuse surrounding these drugs, and then are there any risk factors to the general public. The government is also going to look at psychological and uh, physiological dependence liabilities for the drug. So what are the withdrawal process like? Can you die from it? How is the um, overdose threshold for this type of drug? If you do become dependent on the drug, how long of an abuse history does this drug have for certain individuals? And then are there any immediate precursors of the substance that's already controlled? So codeine is a good act example here. It's a, codeine is a derivative, derivative of opium. So do you classify it the same way as opium, even though it is less addictive, um, or do you classify it differently? Codeine is actually a Schedule Three drug that is more, more commonly mixed in with other types of um, medications. How about opium-based prescription pills? Where do you classify them? Originally they were a Schedule 3 drug and then very recently they were moved up to a Schedule 2 because of the amount of addiction that was happening in this country. 
Here in this chart, it's showing you the dangerousness of the drugs in terms of toxicity. For, this ratio, for these ratios listed on your screen, you can see the effective dose to the lethal dose. So I feel the effect at one point, then how many doses would it take to actually kill me? If you look at this, you go from the least toxic to, least toxic to the most toxic. Look what's right up at the top of this list, the least toxic drug possible, cannabis or marijuana, right? And that's one of the other arguments that comes with marijuana legalization is that it is one of the more safer ones in terms of overdose. Psilocybin comes next. Those are, um, that's the active ingredient in magic mushrooms that causes hallucinations hallucinations, sorry, um, LSD, aspirin, nitrous oxide, which is better known as laughing gas when you go to the dentist. Um, you can also get nitrous oxide um, from whipped cream cans. Prozac is an SSRI antidepressant. Phenobarbital, um, this is one that can be used to treat seizures that come from the withdrawals from benzodiazepines. It is a central nervous depressant. DMT is a psychedelic that is similar in nature to psilocybin. Caffeine, you guys know. Ketamine, you guys should know. Rohypnol, that's your date rape drug. Mescaline is also a psychedelic similar in nature to LSD. Tobacco, you should know. Methadone, you should know. Um, methadone is the opioid that helps you withdraw from heroin. Codeine, we've already talked about. MDMA is ecstasy or molly. It's an upper, a stimulant. Cocaine, methamphetamine, we've already talked about. Um, Dextromethorphan, um, this one is a cough suppressant that is derived from the opium family. It is the active ingredient in a lot, a lot of over-the-counter drugs like Mucinex DM, Vix, NyQuil, or um, Coracetin. And in small amounts, it's fine, but if you were to drink a lot of it, it would cause problems. Alcohol's way up there. Isobutyl nitrate. Um, this is an inhalant type of drugs, more commonly known as poppers. These were really famous in the disco scene, and then again later on in the rave scene. It creates a very euphoric feeling in the user. And GHB is a drug that is used to t uh, treat narcolepsy, insomnia, depression, alcoholism, but then again was turned into a club drug. Um, um, when it comes in the in the powder form. If you dissolve GHB into water, it almost tastes like salt water, but it's sort of off-putting a little bit. And then, of course, heroin. We all know about heroin. This one is the drug with the smallest window to get it right. Um, and there are a lot of heroin overdoses that come from the actual drug, but many people don't know that a significant amount of OD cases actually come because if you're using heroin intravenously, there are a lot of people that don't know how to do it right and end up pushing air through their veins, which then end up, ends up killing them rather than the heroin itself. But we'll talk about this more as we go through this semester. Okay, so bear with me for just a few more minutes. I know this one's getting a little long, but we had a lot to get through. In the last few minutes of lecture here, I want to talk briefly about dependency issues and what solutions are available currently to help with some of these issues. So if we're talking about dependence or addiction, that's something that's recognized as an illness in this country. Um, narcotic addiction and alcoholism are both recognized as diseases by the American Medical Association, and even the Supreme Court of the United States has addressed these statuses as something that cannot, that is not um, worthy of prosecution simply for the status of being an addict. So if someone really is addicted and dependent on a specific drug, then we raise the question as to whether or not incarceration in the traditional sense is the way to go. Do we throw you in prison for the rest of your life or do we get you help? Arguably, a user is very different than a dealer. The dealer might also use, but if they are helping to facilitate other people's uses, um, that's a different story. So that person should maybe go to prison for a longer period of time, but we're also seeing the low-level users go to prison for a significant chunk of time um, due to the language that was written into the, some of the 1980s pieces of legislation coming from the Reagan administration. So does effectiveness mean putting people in prison or does it mean stopping the drug problem? And at this point, are we being effective either way? 
Drug courts are one of the first specialty courts to really focus on the main problems that a lot of offenders face, substance abuse. Drug courts started in Miami in the late 1980s in order to curtail some of the higher rates of drug offenders that were coming out of the area. If you know anything about Miami in the 1980s, you saw a lot of drug runners who were bringing in really high quality coke to the town. Um, this basically established Miami as a party town and a party scene in which the rich um, individuals could go party it up and have a great weekend. However, powder cocaine was known as a rich man's drug. But if you cut the powder cocaine with baking powder and whatever else you want to lace it with and you cook it down, you end up getting crack. Crack is cheaper and some people claim it's actually more addictive because you have to snort it rather than smoke it. But this is not true and pharmacologically it's the exact same drug. It's just the method of administration that gets you high faster. So you have all these drug problems that are going on in the town and basically what Florida says is that we're going to establish some sort of specialized court that is only geared towards these types of drug offenders. and. What a drug court does is basically gives you a chance to get clean rather than processing you through the traditional criminal justice system. And this was done as a way to finally help people get kicked off of coke or or whatever it is that they are taking. Um, so we're going to get you treatment rather than just locking you up in the hopes that you would dry out. There are a variety of different things that you have to adhere to while you're in the drug court. Um, and this has become such a popular type of plan that they have sprung up all over the United States. Um, so this is a map of the drug courts and their locations as of 2013. This is the most recent map that I could get you guys. This is, um, according to this map, you can see that there's higher concentration of drug courts around more metropolitan areas where there are probably higher concentrations of drug use. When you get to more rural areas and things start to thin out a bit in terms of the locations of the drug courts. But drug courts are really only used for a specific type of offender in order to stop the addiction rather than punish the addiction. You aren't going to see drug traffickers or large-scale dealers going into drug courts. These are used for low-level offenders who might only have a small amount of personal use on their person, or they're being arrested for a non-violent crime that was committed to aid the addiction. But at the end of the day, these individuals still committed a crime. So how does this balance out with the goals of the criminal justice system? Really what these specialized courts say um, to the offender is that basically you comply, you go get treatment, you go get so sober, or you're going to go to jail and prison. This is your last ticket out. It's basically a suspended sentence. You're not going to go away. You're not going to be incarcerated unless you violate the terms of your drug court conditions. Then we'll send you away. So the question then becomes, does it work? The answer to this is yes, it does. This infographic shows that there's roughly a 32% difference in recidivism rates for those individuals who went through a drug court program versus those who did not. And if you can get drug users to stop using, not only are you producing healthier citizens, but they're not going back to jail. And that saves us roughly seven to nine million dollars per year per drug court. That's a lot of money that is going back into the system and it shows they're worth continuing for sure. Today we made our way through a lot of information relating to the laws and governmental regulations surrounding drug use in the United States over time. These regulations are in place for a purpose and have helped to limit what people have access to, but the downside to these regulations is that they have helped to create a booming black market in which smuggling and covert action is needed to access these drugs. When the black market takes over, we don't know what these drugs are being cut with or how safe they really are compared to what they're expe we're expecting them to do. Throughout the semester, we're going to be focusing a lot, of the consequence, a lot on the consequences of drug regulation, specifically how Nixon's declaration on the war of drugs and how subsequent administrations have continued to these problems. Meet me back here next time when we pick up on the next chapter in your textbook. I, I thank you guys for your time and your attention, and I hope you have a great day, everyone. I'll see you next time. Bye.